So as such, the meeting this Poliquin has been a primary objective of our group since we formed just less than a year ago. We organized this forum uh, with the help of some other groups uh, to bring people as much information as we could give you so you could choose the strongest candidate among a pretty strong bench sitting over here. Uh, first I want to thank a few people, obviously the candidates for being here, our co-sponsors, Belfast Indivisible, Midcoast Maine Indivisible, Waldo County Chapter of Maine All Care, and Head of the Tide Indivisible. Thank them for their help and solidarity. Also, the Waldo County Dems, who have given us some financial help, but we also give ourselves a lot of help. And finally, I want to thank Josh Gerritsen of Gerritsen Films, who's donating his valuable professional services out of the goodness of his heart. We're especially grateful to our moderator, Tracy Halbuena. Tracy is an emergency, an emergency medicine physician on staff at Penn Bay Medical Center. She's a co-founder and co-leader of our sister group, Midcoast Maine Indivisible in Rockland. Tracy lives in CD1, so we felt she would bring a certain level of objectivity to the discussion tonight. But because she's an indivisible leader, we also know her heart is in the right place, and her eyes are on the progressive prize we all strive for. And then one final thing. If you found yourself cowering under your covers for the last year, or if you're afraid to see or hear the news, I strongly encourage you to engage with a resistance or other civic group. Voting is essential, but it's not enough. Citizenship, especially right now, is a contact sport. And you will feel a lot better if you get out and do something, and I know a lot of you already are. Um, and you will make a difference. We're already making a difference. Um, and I especially thank you for being here when I know there's an important game on. Um, so now I'm turning this over to Tracy and the candidate. until the end, please. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the structure. I'm going to give some introductions and basic information about the candidates, and then they'll each have an opportunity to make an opening statement. Uh, that will be in alphabetical order. In the introduction, you'll notice some FEC data that I am presenting. That's from third quarter 2017. The fourth quarter 2017 data is not yet released. The questions have come from people in CD2, in Congressional District 2. A lot of them were solicited ahead of time. Um, and then also, we've been soliciting questions from you, audience, with the card. <coughs> the time when we would like to have all those cards handed in is by the end of all of the introductions and personal statements, okay? So we've got volunteers that are going to be going up and down the side aisles here collecting the cards. And then we will have screeners over here organizing those questions for clarity, flow, topic, that kind of thing. So let's see, where am I? All right, timekeeping. Most of the questions are going to be two-minute answers. We have a 30-second yellow card, and then we have a red card for time's up. All right, so let's get started. Jonathan Fulford. Mr. Fulford is a carpenter and a farmer. He's 56. He's from Monroe, Maine, and he owns Artisan Builders, a construction company focused on energy efficiency, 
and paying employees a living wage. He has run unsuccessfully twice against Mike Thibodeau for the Maine Senate in 2014 and 2016 and was Maine Clean Elections Act certified for both of those campaigns. Mr. Fulford's wife, Chris, is a midwife in Bangor and they have four grown children. He has raised 68,450 in campaign contributions so far. Mr. Fulford, would you like to give your opening statement? Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming tonight, or this afternoon, and uh, thanks <clears throat> for putting this on. This is really awesome. Uh, great house full of folks. Um, okay, the microphone. Nope, sorry about that. All right, thank you all for coming. And um, uh, so, so one of the questions that, was, you know, that I've been asked, you know, all of us to address in the opening statements is, why do I think that I can win against Bruce Pollock? And I think that the key to winning this race, this, the general election the race against Bruce Pollock, is going to have to turn out the voters that turned out in unprecedented numbers in the caucus last year, and then too many of them faded away because they felt that the Democratic Party was not responsive to actually their concerns and their wishes and their voice wasn't being heard. If we are going to win against Paul Quinn, those voters have to once again decide that the Democratic Party will reflect, or a candidate within the Democratic Party is reflecting their values and their goals. Um, I think that my being a, a working class, small business owner that has supported, that in that race supported Bernie Sanders in the primary and then supported Hillary after that, I think speaks well to actually bringing that unity back to uh, the voter. Um, I'd also say that um, the issues which I find are most critical that we are facing is climate change and ocean acidification. If we do not address that, whatever else we do will not matter. The other thing that that will do is we can actually create a ton of really good paying jobs in every single town in this entire district if we actually put the resources towards it. So when people talk about jobs, that's how you build jobs, you fix problems. Also single payer universal health care and also dealing with the massive inequity in power, wealth, and income, which is destroying the fabric of our society, and as well as is rigging our politics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Jared Golden. Mr. Golden, 35 years old, was born in Lewiston, Maine, and grew up in Leeds. He is currently serving his second term in the Maine State Legislature where he is Assistant Majority Leader for the Democrats. He served four years in the Marine Corps with deployments in Afghanistan and Iraq. Upon, upon returning home from war, he attended Bates College and er, earning a degree in politics. He has worked as a professional staffer for U.S. Senator Susan Collins, as well as a legislative aide in the Maine State House. He served on the Transportation Committee and on the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee. Mr. Golden lives in Lewiston, <coughs> with his wife, Izzy, and works at his family business in Leeds, Springbrook Golf Course. He has raised $104,872 for his campaign so far. Your opening statement. Thank you, Tracy, I appreciate it. Democrats have not won a statewide election in Maine in over a decade. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Let me say that again. Democrats have not won a statewide election in Maine in a decade. That's a serious problem. We've lost this district to Donald Trump in the last election. Bruce Poliquin has been elected in 2014 and 2016. I think it is very clear that our party had better figure out how to meet and address the needs of the people of this community, and we better do it pretty fast. So I'll tell you, in 2016, exit polls told us, voters told us, that they did not feel that they were better off than they were in 2012. At the same time, they voted to approve a minimum wage increase to $12 an hour, and most recently in 2017, these voters also approved Medicaid expansion. We know that people care about economic issues that are gonna impact their daily lives, and that is what this party had better start speaking to. Uh, in Lewiston, same problems. Paula Page has been elected twice in that community. We've lost four straight mayoral races to a conservative 
but at the same time, we're still winning there at the state house level as Democrats. And I, I think it's really important and meaningful because that is a community that has gone through tough economic struggles and it just shows that at the end of the day, what we need to do is keep a laser light focus on economic issues. That is what is gonna turn people out to the polls. It is a clear understanding that going to vote for a democratic candidate is what's gonna help turn the lives around. And that's just what I am committed to doing. It's what I've done successfully in Lewis <coughs> twice now, winning elections by 67 and 71% of the vote. Okay. I'm out of time there, so I'm going to leave it there and, and, and pass it on to Craig. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear us okay? No. No. Hear you fine. <laughs> Louder. How's that? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Way in the back. Can you hear me? Yeah. The candidate we can hear. All right, so next is Craig Olson. Mr. Olson grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin and has worked as an investigator for the state of Wisconsin Public Defender's Office. He's 52. He earned a master's degree in history museum studies. In 2001, he, his wife Melissa, and their three daughters moved to Islesboro, Maine. On the island, he owns and operates a used and rare book business called Artisan Books and Bindery and runs a transfer station. He has served eight years as a member of the Islesboro Planning Board and three years as an elected member of the Isles Board of Selectmen, Islesboro Board of Selectmen, and one year as the chair. According to the FEC, he has raised $78,629 so far. Your opening statement? Thank you. Can you hear? Yep. Thank you for coming out. Um, I'm just so excited to be here. This is uh, great fun um, to be out and talk to people. And for me, this campaign really comes down to getting out in the communities and talking to people and seeing what their issues are and what solutions they might have. Um, living in a small community like we do in Islesboro, um, you know, your neighbor is not somebody who you always agree with, maybe politically, but you know at 3 a.m. you can call them and they're going to be there to help. And that's what I'm finding as I'm going around this community, I'm going around the second district talking to people. It is unbelievable to me the solutions, uh, the, the, the suggestions for solutions that people have and how these regional economies are beginning to develop that we used to only think that we just had mills and fishing and lumber. And some of these regional issues that are coming up are things like boat building here in Belfast. And what we, um, in our community on the island, it's not only about, um, you know, we have a large summer community, but it's also about people who do that in the summer. They do lots of things to keep, you know, to keep the, the wolf from their door, so to speak, which is what we've done, um, had to do in our family as well. And so in getting out and talking to people, my experience, it's interesting, and our family is not different from other people. And be able to get out there and talk to people about what their real concerns are and what solutions they think would work best for the state of Maine is what I'm finding to be the really the most invigorating thing about this campaign. And to actually see results in communities. I mean, with what's going on with the Free Binder through Maine, for me, the real issue is infrastructure and it's healthcare. And it's getting people back to work and also uh, making sure our kids can stay here in Maine, whether that be through education in our community college system or our state university system. It is imperative that we build these regional economies and, you know, build the quality of life that we have in the state. It's a fabulous place to raise your children, and we want to have more children raised in the state. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so next is uh, Tim Rich. Mr. Rich is a successful small business owner, a former health care reform activist for the Service Employees International Union, and a former union organizer for the Maine State Employees Association. In 2011, he opened the Independent Cafe in Bar Harbor as a small takeout espresso shop. It is now one of the busiest casual cafes in Hancock County. Mr. Rich is originally from Maine and lives on Mount Desert Island. He has raised 48737 in campaign contributions so far. Your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Can you all hear me? No. Oh, wow. Is that this one here? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm just uh, I'm getting over a little respiratory infection, so I apologize if uh, my voice goes out here and there. Uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Tracy and uh, Trudy and Michael and everybody else here for doing this today. This is great. You know, I, I think to beat Bruce Poliquin, we're looking at three or four very specific things. I think that people are looking for a new kind of genuineness and honesty in politics. 
I think that they're looking for a clear comparison. Um, I spent most of my life poor. Bruce Pelican, as we know, is very wealthy. Um, I, you know, I'm a, a hardworking person. My family's been hardworking. We worked in the mills for generations in Maine. Um, and, I, and I think people are looking for a really clear vision about what we can all achieve working together in this district and as Mainers and as countrymen. And, you know, I, I think as much as I, as I care, and I care a lot about health care, um, I care a lot about, about, especially about economic inequality, but I think there's a whole other level of problem that we need to address here, and that's the fact that Donald Trump is our president. Yeah. And uh, the unique distinction I think I have among this crew is that I'm the only person to be kicked out of a Trump rally by Donald Trump himself. But I guess I just want to say that, you know, we, we got lucky with Donald Trump in a way. Because uh, I had a feeling, and I know a lot of you did early on, that we might be electing a fascist. The fortunate part is that he wanted to be a net and not authoritarian. Now, now, the real scary thing, when you start looking at Facebook algorithms and you start looking at you know, YouTube and what comes up on people's feeds, is that artificial intelligence is running all of this now and it's splitting our body politics even further and further to the left and the right. And if we can't come together, we can't find common ground around issues, then I really worry about where we're headed as a country. Thank you. Thank you, perfect. Okay, uh, and then finally we have um, Lucas St. Clair. Uh, at 39, Mr. St. Clair is a former small business owner, sportsman, and outdoor guide. He was born in Dover Foxcroft and now lives in Hampton with his wife and two children. He graduated from culinary school in London and returned to Maine after working a while in the big city. He has never held elected office, though eventually became executive director of Elliottsville Plantation Incorporated, which led the successful effort to establish Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. <coughs> he sits on the Quimby Family Foundation Board. He has raised no money in contributions so far, according to the FEC. Your personal statement. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here and coming out. Uh, this is such an invigorating thing to see. Um, I spent the last five years working in northern Maine, traveling around the 2nd District in, in an effort to create the Tide Woods and Waters National Monument, in an effort uh, to give away 90,000 acres of land that my family has acquired over the last 20 years to the National Park Service. It was a controversial idea, as many of you probably have heard, uh, but the opportunity for me to do this work when it arrives um, caused me to go to have as many conversations with individuals as possible. And what I learned over this time is, is people were desperate to be heard. They were desperate to be listened to, and they wanted action taken on behalf of their ideas, on behalf of their communities, in an effort to rebuild economies that once were great, and to, to see rural Maine and, and northern Maine be able to have its, its time again. And there's no doubt in my mind that this can happen. And the, the work around the National Mind that I think is, is uh, a great example of how things can happen when people put their minds to it and build a grassroots foundation to achieve something that otherwise seems impossible. We were able to build a grassroots coalition of, of tens of thousands of people uh, and ultimately convinced President Barack Obama to create the new National Monument. When the Trump administration be decided to review the National Monument, over 200,000 people wrote into the federal government in, in support of, of what was created. And so I think what is strongest in, in our country and what makes the largest impact is when we work together, build a strong grassroots foundation, and together what we can achieve is remarkable. And that is exactly what my hope is uh, to, if I have the pleasure to serve you in the United States Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so now I wanna make sure that everybody who has a question that you wrote down on the little cards um, has an opportunity to hand it in now. Now's your chance. Yep. But we've got volunteers in the aisles to collect questions. Sorry? Oh, do we have any more cards? Do we have any more blanks? Come on. Okay. 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 Okay.
Does any of the screeners have a chance to take a look at them um, while we're talking about a couple of other things? Okay. Is it quiet? All right. So the first question is a two-minute question. It is for Tim Rich. Um, um, okay. So, what is your top issue, and how do you plan to tackle it when you get to Washington? Sure. Uh, well, you know, there are a lot of issues I, I care a lot about. Um, uh, universal health care is one of them. Like I mentioned, economic inequality. But the issue that's most personal to me um, is the opioid crisis going on through Maine and through rural communities all through our country right now. Uh, if you guys wouldn't mind, could I see a show of hands? I'm just curious. How many of you know someone or has a family member, someone who has experienced the trouble with the opioid crisis? Or, yeah, that's, that's what I thought. You know, Maybe. anywhere we go and I ask that question, usually we get at least upper room, if not the whole room. Uh, my, my best friend overdosed on heroin about 15 years ago. I and and to, that's I something that everybody really needs, it you know. The um, week, so. There's a lot that we could be doing that we haven't been doing. Uh, you know, I, I know that Jared and others in the legislature have worked hard <laughs> and, and are moving things forward, but, you know, we got to do it on a national level, and we got to go big time. We, you know, we need to remember and keep in mind that 80% of people who wind up addicted on heroin, 80% start with prescription pain medication. And, and, you know, one of the reasons why it's such a trouble in a place like Maine is that a company called Purdue Pharmaceuticals that created Oxycontin specifically targeted rural Maine and Appalachia because they knew there were high levels of chronic pain and a blue collar community that was stoic and that probably wouldn't complain about it. Uh, these people are immoral and I think it's disgusting and I think we need to start going after pharmaceutical companies and physicians that overprescribe this poison. Thank you. Next, uh, the same question for Jared Golden. What is your top issue and how do you plan to tackle it when you get to Washington? Thank you very much. Can, can you all hear me this time? Yeah. Sorry if I'm not good with a microphone. I'll try and be louder. Uh, great answer, Tim. Uh, I really appreciate what you, what you just said. Uh, for me, through my service on the Transportation Committee and getting back to that focus on, on our economy, uh, one of the things that really bugs me is, is the state of our infrastructure. We underfund our roads here in Maine by about $160 million a year. Uh, and that would be what it would take just to maintain what we have, which I know you all know is, is not competitive and, and not looking for good. So um, we have a president who is talking about making an infrastructure investment package uh, in Congress. The problem that he, uh, I think with his proposal, is that he would have it just be about $200 billion and would rely on states and municipalities to work with private industry to make the rest of that investment. Maine doesn't have money to put forward towards those types of matching funds. We need the federal government to step up and, and make a real investment in rebuilding America and rebuilding Maine. And I think that's going to be very important to creating jobs. We are behind right now. Our state GDP is lower than it was in 2007. We're one of the few states that hasn't actually recovered from the recession. We need that kind of stimulus spending to create jobs rebuild our infrastructure, and that will actually help our, our small business economy as well. So I also think it has the advantage of being an issue for Democrats to be in the majority in Congress and Republicans a majority in the Senate that we could actually deliver on uh, to make sure that we, we follow through on our promises to voters and do something that's meaningful for Maine's economy. Thank you. Is uh, Lucas St. Clair, same question for you. What's your top issue and how do you plan to tackle it when you get to Washington? So, my top issue really is the economy and jobs. Uh, I spend a lot of time traveling around this district and see some of the real hardship that people are facing because of a loss of, um, of a manufacturing economy predominantly. We, in the last decade, we've lost 10,000 jobs in the public paper industry. And, um, and, and on and on and on in, in other sectors of our economy. And I think the best way to approach it in Washington, D.C. is focusing on what, um, in, in what committees uh, a congressman sits on. Congressman Poliquin sits on the Financial Services Committee. Um, this does not work for people in the, in the 2nd District of Maine. 
Uh, it focuses on regulation of banks. While it does have an impact on the, the financial situation in our country, it does not help the second district. Things like the Transportation Committee, the Agricultural Committee, those things are, are having real effects on, like as Jared mentioned, building out infrastructure, bringing SBA, Small Business Administration job, uh, grants, innovation grants. If we worked on energy independence and a renewable energy system in Maine where we could get off reliance of foreign oil, that, that also would create jobs. Uh, and thinking about farming, fishing, and forestry, the three pillars of Maine's economy in a 21st century way. And that is, I think, a really important part to celebrate the culture and heritage of our state, but think about it in a way that makes sense and is relevant in the 21st century economy. There's things that we can do with the forest products industry, such as bring, building cross-laminated timber. The aquaculture industry is having um, some impacts, and we can do more there And st by still uh, harvesting things from the sea, but doing it in a more relevant way. And certainly in, in the agricultural industry, there's a lot that can be done through uh, the infrastructure for commodity farming, but also organic farming on, on the local level. So those, those are the things that I think are most important to help, uh, to help this second CD. Thank you. All right. Is uh, Craig Olson, same question. Um, what's your top issue and how would you plan to tackle it? All these are fabulous issues, and I, you know, you want to tackle them all. For me, actually, the top issue, and it was one of the reasons, is the reason I got into the campaign. I'm not a single issue candidate, but for me, it's affordable health care, and and I came to that simply because, uh, as a small business person raising a family, um, we struggled with affordable health care in my family. We struggled with a ten thousand dollar deductible when we were self-insuring uh, ourselves and our and our family. And also then, um, and we were very fortunate with the ACA to be part of the ACA and have a $5,000 deductible, which was a decision we made based on our budget and our budget for our family and our budget for our business. Then two years ago, I got skin cancer. And you know that was a $2,300 bill. At the same time, the boiler went out in our house. And then we were getting behind. And the fuel oil, we were getting behind. And we were lucky where we lived that there's a community foundation that stepped up and helped us out. But most people don't have that. And in watching this past year, where we had this attempt, you know, the three times trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act, having Congressman Pollockman voting to repeal the Affordable Care Act, we had people who were making decisions about topics that they had never had to struggle with. So for me, it's about affordable health care is probably one of the primary focus because that's something that rings true with me. As a businessman, if I knew what that health care costs every year, you could budget for it, but with the skyrocketing increases, it's it's an almost impossible. So you're between a rock and a hard place. One of the first things I would do, and of course, if I was congressman, yeah, I'd be 434 probably on the seniority list. But I would introduce a bill, and I would keep introducing it, requiring that everybody in Congress take the insurance that's offered in their state. Yeah. You've had to navigate that system you would be making choices and you would be making changes. It would make your head spin how quickly we would have a health care system and a health insurance system that worked for everyone. Okay, and then uh, finally for this question, uh, Jonathan Fulford, same question. What's your top issue and how would you tackle it? Um, it has to be climate change still. And the solution to climate change, which will actually be the basis of restoring a strong and vibrant economy. That if, if we do not, as I said, we do not tackle that, it really won't matter what else we do. Because we will not have a future for our children and for us to enjoy. So to tackle that with all the resources that it will take means we have to insulate and renovate every building in every town. And have to make it so it's, an, it's a financially viable for every homeowner to do that. Right? That's a big job. That's a lot of plumbers, that's a lot of electricians, it's a lot of solar installation. That's a lot of work. But if we can give a trillion and a half dollars to the wealthiest people in this country, just so that they can have another island in the Bahamas, then we, you know, we, can, we can do this and that's the other thing we tackling climate change does is means we focus on actually having our forestry and our fishing and our farming, as people said, to actually have to be part of the transformation and making them economically viable is making them actually meet the demands of carbon sequestration 
and production of food that we have to actually step up in the Northeast. We have to have that as what our goal is. Because we have to look at what's actually threatening our entire society globally and nationally. And the role Maine has to play in actually meeting some of the important, um, important needs that are, that are rising. Um, I wish I could say a couple other options too, but uh, I'll stop there. Yeah, good, thank you. So now I have um, some pre-selected questions uh, that are more particular to each of the candidates and then we'll move into the questions that we've collected from you guys. Um, I do want to say that we're doing really well with the time right now, um, but I would um, like to remind you to hold your applause to the end just for time's sake because I really want to hear a lot of what the candidates have to say. So the next question is for Tim Rich. Uh, you proposed um, Medicare for all at a cost-effective form, um, as a cost-effective form of universal health care. <coughs> what is the greatest barrier to achieving that? Sure. Um, well, I, I do believe that, that Medicare for all is the way to go, but really I think there's a lot of different ways to get us to single payer. There's a lot of different, I should say, there's a lot of different ways to get us to universal coverage. And I think that's what's most important. Uh, you know, I really like the, the Medicare for all plan, largely because insurance companies um, and inefficiencies in our system eat up about a third of healthcare costs right now. Um, insurance companies routinely have 15 to 20% profit margins, and that's money that is not going to your healthcare, that's money that's going into the pockets of fat cats. And, and I, so I think that's morally reprehensible. I think we need to get rid of the insurance companies, step one. But, but asking you know, what the biggest um, kind of block to that would be, is I would have to say, you know, lobbyists and lobbying money. Um, you know, I think all around, we saw it in the 90s when the Clintons tried to do it. Uh, we started it in 2008 when Obama did it, and they, they didn't allow him to have a public option uh, in Obamacare. Uh, I, you know, I think it's huge. I think that the, the sort of linchpin to all of this and all the issues we're going to talk about today is campaign finance reform and, and making sure that we turn back uh, some of the stuff that's been done in the last few years and that, you know, I actually, I love what they do for the governor's race in Maine. I think we should have matching funds available for congressional races. And, and going forward, I think that's how, that's how we fix that problem. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Jared Golden. This is a two-minute question. Um, so you missed three important environmental votes, including the solar bill. Um, say a little bit about your position on solar energy. Thank you very much. Um, certainly, uh, I, one of the things I take most importantly is uh, being there on the House floor to take a vote. It's actually uh, the first time I ever um, missed a vote on the House floor in the three years I've been there, and I, I regret that very much. In terms of solar, uh, I would just say look to all the other votes that I've taken in, in support of solar energy. The bill uh, that did not pass, I supported repeatedly throughout the process. Uh, in the last legislature, unfortunately, the governor vetoed it, as you all know. Um, and uh, you know, you got to do the math. There were uh, failed by about I think seven votes. Uh, there weren't enough Democrats in the room or absent to make up the difference there. Uh, unfortunately, at the end of the day, it came down to those Republicans who supported the initial enactment of the bill and then um, changed their vote when the governor pulled his support and, and vetoed it. But. In terms of solar, I am all in on every, any and every investment that we can to, to push that forward, whether that be at the federal or state level. Uh, I think that we need to focus on doing solar, uh, you know, at, not only at the residential level, but at the commercial level. It's something that I think communities like Lewiston and others all over the state should be looking into in terms of, we, we got a lot of empty mill space, a lot of rooftop where we could be putting solar panels in and putting that towards municipal energy. Uh, and helping to drive down uh, costs locally, but also certainly very important, as Jonathan has alluded to, that we be making our homes more efficient. And when we invest uh, as a government or uh, as a society in, in solar energy, we're, we're doing that, and uh, you know, we're creating jobs. So um, I think that's, that's all I'll, I'll say about it for now. Um, whether it be tax credit type programs or, or direct uh, government investment in making solar uh, in, solar more affordable for, for people or for businesses, uh, I'll, I'll support all of that at, at, at any level. Thank you. Thanks. All right, this next question is for Lucas St. Clair. Voters in Congressional District 2 continue to be divided on the Cantadon uh, monument. 
how will you appeal to all of them? So the division exists uh, in the media, but it certainly doesn't exist on the ground. The last poll that was done in the second district showed 78 percent of, of, of voters supportive of the national monument, and that uh, support had grown from about 56 percent support when we started in this work in 2011. Uh, so the reality is it's supported by a huge majority, uh, more than any other political figure or, um, or referendum that has come forward uh, other than bond issues for the, in the last decade. And the work that was done in order to build that support was from one-on-one -on -one conversations, speaking to individuals, meeting them where they are, and incorporating compromise. Uh, in the Katahdin region, snowmobiling is a very important part of the, an important, important part of recreation and, and the economy. And so we worked with the Park Service to allow for 33 miles of snowmobile trails in the National Monument. Uh, hunting is also an incredibly important part of, of the local heritage and culture in, in the Katahdin region. And we worked with the Par Department of uh, Interior and the Department of Justice to allow for uh, some issued some allowances on the title before transfer that allowed for hunting in over 37,000 acres of the National Monument. This is the first National Monument that was created in 110 years that allowed uh, for hunting in the National Park Service. So we're really proud of that work and bringing people together. And this was not a partisan issue. This was Republicans and Democrats coming together, building a big tent, and that grassroots support carrying the day in the end. Thank you. All right, um, next question is for Craig Olson. You are in favor of some form of federal universal health care insurance program. Would you be willing to compromise in the short term to expand current access to health care short of the universal coverage goal? Yes. I, I, it's something that has to be done incrementally. I mean, that, you know, it, it, What was it, Rahm Emanuel said, never waste a crisis. Um, I don't think we're at a level of crisis where we could institute a, a system that simply was, you know, the next day it was, it was there. Um, I think it has to be incremental. I think you have to work with insurance companies. You have to limit the lobbying and, and the price gouging that's happened because of the, the um, increased drug prices and not being able to negotiate certain things. Uh, no, I, the Medicare for All model is a it, it, it's it's a good model when you talk about Medicare for All. It makes sense to people, but Medicare is a little bit different from Medicaid, and how the, the the funds are distributed are different. So, I would say a universal care system that is based in some ways on how we as a business, you know, 2.95 percent of of salary goes to Medicare. So why don't we increase that to six, three percent from the from the employer, 3% from the employee, and everyone's covered, of everybody who's working. I, that's one of the ways I think that you could actually start to fund such health care. We don't have to self-diagnose our children thinking, you know, I, I, is it bad enough I should take them in? What's my deductible? Can I afford to build that deductible? And so I think that we need lower deductibles that are universal, and we need a base level of care that everyone can afford. Thank you. All right, uh, Jonathan Fulford. What have you learned from your two previous losses that will help you win this election? Uh, <clears throat> a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't regret any minute of going against Mike Thibodeau in spite of not coming out winning. I learned a lot. I made a lot of good friends, met a lot of good people, learned a ton about Waldo County and around, about the state and then threw myself at Augusta for the last four years in between each race, trying to even learn more about how politics actually works. Um, it's been a great experience. I recommend it for everyone. Um, and uh, I think that it has seasoned me to know kind of what it's like to go up against a powerful Republican machine. And I know that Politics will even be more powerful than even Mike Thibodeau. And, <clears throat> but I've seen some of what they do. And it's like, all right, bring it. I'm ready. Um, and I think also that it has also made it clear to me that a populist economic message resonates and that single-payer universal health care resonates with poor rural communities. If you actually talk about meeting people's needs, exactly when they talk about really what, how, how hard their lives are, and when you listen, then that's how you actually can uh, both have the support 
you know, if we win the election, but more importantly, the support I think for making the, the big um, changes to our society, which we need in order going forward. So. Thank you. Is this question, next question intended for a particular candidate? All right, so this is a two minute um, answer, and you can each have a turn to answer this. All four federally recognized tribes in Maine are located in the second congressional district. Do you believe that these tribal communities should enjoy the same rights and benefits that all the other federally recognized tribes in the United States enjoy? As the recent Suffolk University shows, an 11th hour anonymous clause was inserted into the 1980 Federal Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act without the knowledge or consent of tribal representatives. This clause prohibits Maine tribes from benefiting from just such legislation unless they are explicitly named in the legislation. What will you do to address this injustice? And we'll go with Tim Rich first. Yeah, sure. Um... I, I very much do believe that. Uh, you know, one of the first meetings that, that I took when I decided to run for this position was with Molly and Dana, uh, with the ambassador for the Penobscot Nation. Um, I, I very much believe that, that we owe it um, to our Native American brothers and sisters to make sure that the law is equally applied. Um, and I mean, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say on that. It would be a, a priority for me if I was to be elected. So, um, same question to Jared Golden. Thank you. Um, you know, I think the biggest problem with that is, is what you read, which is that it was written into the contract, uh, and, and that has been a repeated impediment to any progress uh, for, for our tribal nations here in, in the state of Maine, um, and really been a problem, uh, so much so that we've even seen uh, at the Attorney General's level uh, that uh, individuals who may be supportive of, of helping the tribes um, find their hands tied um, defending the state because of that. So. Uh, you know, to the degree that the federal government could get involved and take any action, I would be there. I think that it is ultimately probably a matter of supporting that openly and publicly and, and also um, pushing for the courts to uh, consider that, when, you know, and I think the tribes are going to have to um, bring that to the courts for, for their decision. So whether that be advocating uh, and making sure that we're nominating a court system that represents our democratic values, um, speaking very clearly to Maine's governor, who is the one who is ultimately in, in that position of uh, deciding how to apply the laws in, in an equal and fair manner. But um, I, I certainly believe that they should be treated completely uh, equally and, and fairly before Maine's laws. And uh, one issue that I would not be able to resolve that as a congressman, but I do think that we could put forward as one solution is, isn't it about time that they have representation in, in the Maine state legislature? <laughs> They don't have the benefit of a vote on the House floor, and therefore they don't have the benefit of, of, of having their voice heard. Um, and I think that that needs to change. So Thank you. All right, um, same question to Mr. St. Clair. So I agree I, um, with, with everything that's said. The, the Maliseets, Micmacs, Penobscots, and Passamaquoddy deserve the sovereign jurisdiction over their lands and waters that have been taken away from them incrementally over the last 300 years. There's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, from a legal basis and otherwise to, to make this square again. Uh, the 1980 Indian Claims Act has, has um, needs, in my opinion, to be addressed and, and uh, reworked in order to give uh, tribal nations uh, an equal level of, of play because it is, is completely unfair to see this how the populations have been marginalized. I think in addition to the legal pursuit of, of making a more level playing field, we have to work closely with the tribes in order to celebrate the traditions that they all hold uh, very dearly. And I've been working with the tribes very closely over the last many years uh, in, in, on the east branch of the Penobscot, which is a very sacred river, and, and, and Mount Katahdin, which is a part of the, the Penobscot's mythology, celebrating their language, their, the geography, and the history that they have on this land from the last ice age uh, is an incredibly important thing. 
the organization Gedakana in, um, and, and working with them to help uh, tribal youth understand language and learn their, their native language and learn the traditions of storytelling and uh, exploring in the woods, basket making, all are incredibly important to be able to invigorate uh, the, the tribes and I think that ultimately will lead to uh, a further pursuit all the way to, to, a legal, um, to, to legal outcomes that will change the way that they have um, jurisdiction over their lands and waters now. Great, thank you. All right, um, Craig Olson, same question. Being fourth makes this a lot easier. Um, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, wholeheartedly. What I, what I find reprehensible really is that the exclusion of, of main trucks from this, this bill and this language, and I just, I, I, it's reprehensible, and I don't think, I think that these Native people need the same representation across this country. I mean, why should we be, why should we be changing things um, for the main Native peoples and not, um, you know, offering the same benefits that the other tribes across the country have. So, um, having lived on the edges of reservations in, in Western Iowa, um, it is amazing um, the issues, the problems, the opportunities that these, these institutions and these places have. And um, I want to see all people treated equally in the same way. Thank you. And then finally, same question to Jonathan Fulford. So the, um, can, there is continuing uh, institutional genocide being played out in both our state government and I believe in our federal government with the way in which the tribes are not treated as equal sovereign nations consistently. And I think that the rulings that have happened uh, recently around the water rights as well um, with the Penobscot are a continuation of that very same problem. And in as a elected to Congress, I would not have a direct say in that, but I think making sure that anytime you're a person has a public voice, to be clear on what one thinks, what one sees as the challenges and the problems that, that in any situation and with the, with, um, with the tribes, that is one of the key ones right now. And as far as like not having the representation, again, being really clear, yeah, they should have a full vote. Yeah, I think that's, you're absolutely right there. And um, yeah. Great. Thank you. All right, lightning round. Ready? This is a yes, no, yes, no. Uh, would you support impeaching Trump based on current information? Let's go with uh, Jonathan Fulbright. It would have to go through the right procedures, but I think there is enough right now that already has been put out there that um, I think an impeachment could probably be brought. I mean, you don't just say like, pop it, but yeah. Uh, Craig Olson. Right now, no, because I don't think the case has been made in in the situation or in the court type of situation within the Congress that needs to be made. Uh, Lucas St. Clair. Also, I, the, the, the investigation needs to continue. I don't believe there's enough information at this point, and it ultimately takes a two-thirds vote of the Senate before anything can, can move. So as a member of the House, I think the most important thing we can do is play a backstop to policy rather than focusing on impeachment. Uh, Jared Golden. No, not until the evidence is absolutely bulletproof. We saw this at the state level. Uh, if House Democrats had voted to move to impeachment on the governor, we would have been seeing uh, a, a failed uh, court case that had already been filed against him. So I think you've got to have the evidence first. And uh, finally. Tim Rich. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I think we have the evidence. <laughs> Next question is for um, Tim Rich, and it's a two-minute question, and it's about aging. Um, as our <laughs> I turned 40 this year. <laughs> as the population ages, there's a greater need for programs to support the elderly, as well as people with disabilities, to live in safety in their own homes and for as long as possible. Right now, there's a shortage of workers willing to be home healthcare aides because of the wages. Uh, they're too low uh, to live on. What would be your solution to this growing problem? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's very direct. I mean, we need to, to pay people better. Um, everything from CNAs who work in nursing homes 
to at-home care, you know, all the way up. I know RNs do pretty well, uh, but once you go beyond that, you do very well. But there are a lot of people who can't even afford uh, to pay their own rent, and they're out giving care to our, our most vulnerable and our elderly. I mean, you know, it, it used to be that we lived in a world where when somebody got older, they would move back into your house. And, and it was a, a very kind of contained family unit. And unfortunately, a lot of the larger changes in the world uh, and the way that economics works now and the fact that people move all around the country, that's not really <clears throat> applicable in the same way. So we need to make sure that people are taken care of. I, I think another part to that is also to make sure that, that we, we start addressing, honestly and openly, this kind of epidemic of loneliness going on with, with our aging population. Uh, and you know, a big part of that is, is at-home care isn't just you know, straight up at home, you know, take care of you, make sure you're safe. A lot of time, you know, that's a friendship for these people. And, and we need to make sure that folks are, are paid appropriately um, and compensated well for, for that work. Thank you. All right, so next question is for, let's see, let's do St. Clair, Lucas St. Clair. It's about healthcare. What are the pros and cons of making Medicare our universal health care versus improving the ACA? Which do you support and why? I support a universal health care where um, in a single payer system. And I spent last Friday uh, in the living room of a guy named uh, Bill Caper, and he started uh, Maine All Care. Uh, Jonathan, I believe, is on their board. And uh, he has, has been spending the last 25 years of his life focusing on uh, insurance and healthcare and the challenges with it. And the way it was explained to me is that uh, the ACA is inherently confusing, and I think we all can realize that. Um, the great simplicity of a single-payer system, and it was, it was laid out by Craig uh, with a percentage of wages from and, and, and pay from employers and employees, and everyone pays into the same system and everyone gets the same health care, makes it incredibly simple and is the ultimate equalizer. I think that's the best system for healthcare in our country, and I think it's certainly the easiest and the easiest to implement. Uh, we've heard a lot tonight about the challenges, or this afternoon, about the challenges, and I think the biggest challenge with it is the fact that the insurance lobby and the healthcare lobby has uh, more money to spend in, than the entire defense lobby in our country. And it, that is just an absurd thought. And uh, if, if we can focus on taking money out of politics and the ultimate corruption in our democracy, I think that these, these problems for single-payer health care would be simple to resolve. All right, next question is for uh, Craig Olson. The Republican Congress has managed to deny, trivialize, and condemn climate change as a serious issue, and all the while insisting that jobs um, trump any consideration of this urgency. What would you do to help the conservation and repudiate those in Congress who continue to prevent any movement forward? Well, I would keep harping on science, even though people don't seem to be listening on one side of the aisle to, to the science argument, but uh, we cannot deny that our lobsters are moving north. They're moving to warmer water. They're warming, moving to cooler waters. We're having that issue, I know, out on the island and other places. Um, the ocean acidification, I mean, it's all happening. The data is there. You have to keep hammering away at these things, and I think the unfortunate thing that's happened in the past few years is that we've gotten into a mindset of everything has to be taken care of in the next quarter of the business cycle. And that is not the case. I mean, it has to be. We have to look at these things over a long-term period of time. We have to talk to both members of the now. And the interesting thing that I run into as I'm out talking to people is when you actually sit down and talk to people, it's amazing how many similarities you have and how many opinions that maybe at first you don't quite agree with them, but as you begin to have a conversation, people begin to admit that, yeah, we are having an issue. We, you know, we, we are having an issue on the island with Lyme disease because of the tick population. It's getting warmer, and these ticks are living longer, and the lobsters are going further north. I had a conversation at the basketball game on the island the other night with our local lobsterman, and we were talking about, he's, he truly feels, and this, he's been lobstering for quite a while, that within the next few years, the bottom is going to fall out of the lobstering industry because of these lobsters moving. 
And he's going deeper and deeper as he fishes, as he's catching fewer lobsters, and with what's happening with Canadian lobstering and um, price infrastructure. He really sees an issue. So you have to keep hammering away. It's not going to happen right off the bat, but you have to talk with people about what has happened in their community. And I'm talking about people across the aisle, people who you're working with in Congress. What's happening in your community and having that conversation, it, it's not going to happen overnight. It has to be a slow, slow burn. Thank you. All right. This next question is for Jonathan Fulford. Uh, what do you believe are the most important fundamental um, characteristics of an individual serving in public office? Um, name and talk about three or four of them. <laughs> um, wow. What are the individual characteristics you would love to see? Um, integrity, hard work, and a willingness to listen to um, and learn from everybody that one has contact with. Am I supposed to have two minute answers? Yeah, that's a two minute answer, so if you have more thoughts on that, go ahead. Uh, well, I think, I think also that um, this isn't so much of a personal characteristic, but as far as like I think what you have to bring to it is actually not being willing to conduct yourself in a way that politics have been conducted for you know for a long time, and that means not taking any corporate money, no lobbyist money, no corporate PAC, money, you know, no corporate PAC money, no lobbyist money, no dark money, no co-mingled PAC money if it has more than 10% of it, you know, being from corporations. I think you have to say everybody says, yeah, I will not take, you know, I will not, you know, money politics is a problem. You have to actually not then take it, not wait for the Supreme Court to finally say it's illegal to, for you to take it, but to have actually, this is part of integrity, of saying actually I'm willing to actually take the risk of actually being only supported by the people. Okay, thank you. And then finally on this round, uh, round for Jared Golden. What, this is a two minute answer, what is your opinion about the United States calling Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Thank you. Um, you know, there's a long-standing history there of, uh, I think, American foreign policy not taking that position, and I think that this is really shaking things up and destabilizing the, the region. There's a reason why we have not um, made an effort to, to move uh, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem uh, as a way of indicating that it is uh, you know, the position of the United States, whether or not Jerusalem is the capital of, of Israel. Um, you know, I think that we, we should stay the course in terms of, of uh, allowing for the peace process to move forward without, without taking those types of actions. So I, I guess I think it was an ill-advised move and, and one that I think we're already seeing the way in which it is destabilizing uh, the region and preventing any uh, ability for uh, an honest brokering of a, a, a peace deal and continued talks. Uh, and I, I think that stated my position as, as clearly as I could there. Um, but uh, you know, I think certainly unfortunate uh, that, that we've taken that unilateral step at this point. Thank you. All right, the next um, question is um, a question posed to each of the candidates. Jonathan, you've already more or less answered this question. It's about um, campaign finance. And the question um, by the submitter was written as, are you taking PAC money? Um, so you can answer it again if you like. Um, sure. Briefly, please. I will take PAC money, but only if it is funded 90% or more by individual donations. That's how the PAC has to be actually funded. So say an environmental group which actually met that standard, wanted to support that campaign, I would feel that was actually an accurate reflection of, of voter and individual support, and I would accept it. Anything more than that? No. Thank you. Let's just go down the table. Absolutely. Um, you know, like Jonathan just referred to, some PACs uh, are, are different than others. Um, in, in some ways, it is also a reflection of, of the problem of, of our money and politics in general. I do like the idea of having a publicly funded option available for people out there. Uh, it, it works well in Maine. I know that people have fought for it at the federal level. Uh, it can be funded, um, and you know you can set a base level that is acceptable for winning campaigns. And then I think, as Tim suggested, if you see a lot of corporate PAC money flowing in against someone, um, kind of you know, bump that up. But um, I, I'm I'm going to make a commitment to not taking corporate PAC money. I uh, would be surprised if anyone sitting at this table 
does not, um, and you know, sticking with any Citizens United to address the, the problem. Um, at the end of the day, what I'll tell you right now is I've raised uh, about $350,000 since I got into this race at an average contribution of just about $100. So that's 3,100 individual contributions from people like you. Uh, and, and I think that's how we're all going to commit to raising the money that we need to compete with your problem. It, and I, I agree too. I mean, public funding for me, I really think is is what we need for the federal federal elections. I mean, we already get what is it three dollars? We can check off our uh, our personal income tax that we can contribute to a presidential election fund. I mean, I think we should have the same for federal elections elections for Congress. Um, and I, you know, tax money it, it's a it, it's it can be a really uh, a really scary area because you sometimes don't know who's behind that money. And I agree with uh, both Jared and. and and uh, Jonathan, that I really want to know where that money is coming from, who are the contributors, you know, and if somebody like Ben and Jerry have a pack, you got it, I'm on, I'm on board. Uh, but, uh, you know, something that's shady and we're not, you know, you're not quite sure about, it, and no, it's not something I want anything to do with. Uh, yeah, you know, I've said this before, uh, if I was in a position where one of the unions I used to work for that I believe in came to me and offered me some back money, I'd totally take it. Uh, I think for the most part, 98%, I can say that I wouldn't accept corporate PAC money. Uh, I think that's fair. You know, I, I think there's something that none of us have talked about. Uh, I, I hope nobody takes this the wrong way. But I, but I think it goes beyond PAC money, too. You know, um, the, the, the National Democratic Party that, that kind of focuses and specializes on congressional elections, the, they call it the DCCC. And the DCCC came in here um, in, in July, and I know a bunch of us met with them, I met with them, and, and asked them, you know, to not be involved at all in the primary process until we sort out kind of how we feel. And in that conversation, they agreed, and then they, they recruited Jared, and I know they, they talked to Lucas and others. You know, I, I really strongly believe that the National Party doesn't have a role to play at all whatsoever until after our primary is done. And that's maybe a much bigger deal than any question about PAC money that we're facing right now. Thank you. So um, I think the uh, preaching to the choir here, but um, we, you know, I think that Citizens United and money in politics has been the ultimate corruption of our democracy in, in our lifetime. And we will not be able to see lawmakers uh, be influenced by their constituents when they're getting millions of dollars uh, of funding from corporations and lobbyists and, and so on. And so I think Jared made a very good point. I don't think any of us here are going to get any money from corporations. You know, we're just not the, not the target audience for that. Uh, but certainly our opponent will and has and will continue throughout the rest of this election. And if, if we want to gain institutional power win elections and make the changes that we want to see in order to take money out of politics, we do have to play in this paradigm. So we do have to continue to raise money. We have to work very hard with individuals to raise money. And I think the best way to do it is to grow grassroots support and get as many small dollar donations from people all over this country that are committed to making sure that the house turns blue in 2018. With that said, with that said, PAC money is, is, is as described. There are good PACs and there are bad PACs. Certainly the bad PACs are not going to play a role in this race for any of us. Um, but we will certainly look to places like Planned Parenthood and League of Conservation Voters and 314 PAC and the unions to be able to support our race and the monies that come into this race will, will help us win. But we also have to remember, at the end of the day, it's not money that's going to win this race. It's grassroots foundational support from the voters of this district. And so, while money is important, it is not the thing that is going to ultimately win this race, and we have to stay very focused on being able to listen, hear, and act on the, the needs and wants of, of the voters in the second district. Thank you. All right, this next question is again posed to- To go forward with, and we have to approach it very carefully going forward. All right, so thank you. Same question to Jericho. 
Thank you. So, uh, very familiar with guns, I can tell you, as someone that served in the Marine Corps infantry, I understand guns uh, and the importance of gun safety and responsible gun ownership. The Marines didn't allow you to own a gun uh, in, on the barracks. So, personal weapons, all weapons that you had actually had to be checked in to the armory. Uh, and so, I think. You know, that's something that a lot of people don't know. I, I went three months in the military before they ever put a loaded weapon in my hand because they wanted to make sure that I was highly trained. So number one, good smart policy ensures that people get the training that they need to be safe with their weapon. Um, secondly, I support background checks. Uh, I'm never going to support any effort to undermine or repeal the background check system. We all know that we want to keep guns out of the hands of people who uh, are, are, you know, well, it's criminals, uh, potential terrorist actors, whoever it is, that, that's why background checks are there. That's good common sense policy. Um, you know, at a higher level, let's talk about the uh, kind of militarization of, of society and the way that we talk about warfare uh, in this country. We put it uh, forward in our video games and our movies. Um, it's, it's glorified. Um, and, you know, that's probably driving a lot of, of our gun culture and our gun sales. So, um, you know, I think we all have to stop and ask ourselves what's our role in that. And, uh, you know, it's a big for-profit industry. So, uh, bottom line, I do think it's important that Democrats make very clear that we don't want to take away people's guns. We want people to be able to you know, be responsible gun owners, go and hunt, uh, go to the shooting range and have fun. I mean, look, I'm not going to lie, guns can be fun, but at the same time, um, we don't need people walking around with, with the types of machine guns and, and, and weaponry that I carried when I was in Afghanistan or Iraq. Thank you. Same question for Lucas St. Clair. What does common sense gun policy look like to you? Well, I learned how to shoot a gun from my grandfather. The first time I ever discharged a firearm was a 22 rifle. My grandfather held my arms as I steadied it and shot it for the first time. And my father and I grew up, I grew up with my father hunting in, in northern Maine, and it is a part of our heritage, and I think sportsmen and the use of guns go hand in hand, but it also a big part of the heritage of gun ownership in Maine is teaching that safety from grandfathers and fathers to sons, and 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 grandmothers and grandmothers. <laughs> 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 The, uh, my, my twin sister didn't take to uh, shooting the 16-gauge uh, shotgun the same way I did. Um, but the, those, it's, it's incredibly, uh, a, a part of our, our history and our heritage and culture is teaching that safety. Uh, when, I was in, when I was eight years old, I took a hunter safety course at Santa Monica Junior High School in Guilford, Maine. That's where I learned uh, to, to the safety of, of, of firearms. And I think that we should make very certain that, that people, when they use, own, and operate firearms, that they're taking those safety courses. I think background checks are absolutely uh, necessary, and I supported background checks, um, the referendum in, in Maine that narrowly lost, and I will continue to do that. And so I think that uh, I also I also agree with the culture of guns in the United States has been glorified, and, I, and we we need to make sure that weapons are thought of as as a tool and a tool that can be very dangerous, and that the training and and the background checks go into place before anyone owns or operates a firearm. Thank you. Same question to Jonathan Fulford. Sorry, switch it up a little bit. Um, so uh, I support background checks. And I support a, a, a continuing a ban or on bump st or having a ban on bump stocks and silencers. I think that uh, I have guns. All my kids have guns. Now one of my grandchildren has a gun. We hunt. Um, and some of us enjoy shooting. I think using them as a tool as a farmer has also been a good, a big part of our family. Um, so I see the value of guns, but I also see also the importance of making sure they're in responsible hands. There are people I know very well who would not qualify with a background check because of the things that they've done in their life, and I do not want them to have guns in their hands. You know, background checks are an important part of keeping our, our society safe. So, and, I, and I guess I'd also say that, <clears throat> so every time you know people are afraid of losing their guns, they buy more. Um, I think that's a sign of also the divisiveness which our culture is kind of like, is happening, and the level of fear which people carry. And I think as we don't see, I think, 
no matter where we are in the political spectrum right now, I think the future does not look hopeful. And that leads to greater fear, and one of the responses of fear is, I'm going to try to protect myself and my family better. And I think if we start looking at it as creating a more inclusive and hopeful future, I think that might also be in an indirect way address a lot of the other problems. Craig Olson, you're the last one to answer this question. Okay. Thank you. I, I grew up hunting with my father. I grew up in, on, on a farm, and hunting was just part of the fabric of the community. It was part of the fabric of our family. still is. I don't hunt now. Um, we don't have guns in our house in Islesboro, and it's just, you know, we, we, don't, we don't hunt on Islesboro with guns. It's not allowed by the state. Um, <laughs> but about five or six years ago, I took all of our dogs. We have three daughters, and they were 9, 11, and 13. And I took them through the hunter safety course, and I went through it with them with the sporting club on Islesboro because they go to houses with friends who have guns. And I wanted them to know what was appropriate, what you did if there was a gun in the house, if somebody picked up a gun who shouldn't be picking up a gun. Um, and they went through it, and it was, it was a great experience for us. Um, we still, we don't have guns in the house, but it's part of, there's a hunting ethos in Maine, just like where I grew up, and when I grew up in Wisconsin, it was the same, it was hunting. Uh, what we've seen in this society is, is this um, really the kind of spoon feeding of the protection uh, mantra from the NRA. And I find that just reprehensible, the way that it is done and the, the, the material that they push out. And the fact that they're creating this culture of fear that behind every tree is someone waiting to get you. And so what they're really doing, the real thing about the NRA, and it's not so much that they're advocating for hunters, I don't believe, or they're advocating for supporting people or people who are shooting trap, but they're advocating for the gun lobby, the gun manufacturers, to sell more guns. It has nothing to do with personal protection. The scary thing, too, about last fall I went to the Bangor Gun Show, and I hadn't been to a gun show in 20 years. I'd gone with my father about 20 years ago. What really chilled me was the fact that you could buy silencers. And then this past year there was a bill, I think it was H.R. 387 or 1387, and it was the Hearing Protection Act. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the gun, it was the bill to allow the universal sale of silencers in all 50 states. And that's reprehensible. There is no reason we need that. We do not need bump stocks. Uh, we just, you know, it, the NRA has gone well too far. Thank you. All right. Turn our attention to a different topic now. This question is also for all five of you. It's a two-minute answer, um, and it's about um, essentially reproductive rights. Would you call yourself a feminist? And what does your answer mean for your stance on reproductive rights? And we're going to start at the end of the table with Mr. St. Clair and just work our way down. I would call myself a feminist. I. Um, have a, a lot of very powerful female figures in my family and um, they have taught me a lot about what it's like to um, be captains of industry to support um, the, a, a matriarch as a head of household and um, the rights that um, the, the rights that have been held back from women over the course of history have been a huge challenge and uh, created so many different types of, of, uh, of issues from uh, economic to uh, family isolation uh, and, and, and on and on. I, I spent um, Thursday morning with Eliza Townsend at the, um, uh, the Maine Women's Lobby and the Women's Policy Center and, and to hear her speak about uh, single women that are raising uh, raising children in Maine and the obstacles around child care, access to public transportation, being able to get to the workplace, the uh, lack of equal pay, uh, and, the, and lack of health care, and then the fact on top of all of that that their health care choices are being limited by old white men in Congress is a deplorable thing to consider. And um, my, my wife's family have, has worked in the, the medical field for their entire lives. My mother-in-law, who lives with us now, uh, is, was a, a nurse midwife, and I know the challenges that are faced um, for, for women and access to reproductive rights, uh, reproductive health, and, and general health. And 
to the fact that uh, religious ideology is dictating whether or not women have access to health care is, is a terrible thing, and I, I absolutely support uh, equality for, for women in this country. I have a feeling there's probably not going to be too much disagreement with all of us in this question. Um, I, I very much do consider myself a feminist. You know, uh, before I ever worked in politics or owned a cafe, before, uh, before I ever wanted to work in politics or owned a cafe, um, I, I had trained to be a novelist at one point. And so a lot of the way that I approached the world has been through works of literature. Um, and I wrote a lot of kind of early French feminism, um, Simone de Beauvoir and what have you, and, and um, Erica Jong in the 70s, The uh, Fear of Flying. And, and I, I, I think a lot about, you know, what women have really been through in this country and how horrible it's been. And it impacts me really personally. I have, I have two quick stories about, uh, about my family. I have a, a family member um, who unfortunately was, uh, was raped at 12 years old and, and didn't feel comfortable coming out and being honest about it until they were well into their 60s because the person who did it threatened to come and kill them. Um, I also have, I have an aunt who uh, was in the army and became pregnant back in the early 70s. And my grandfather, we come from a, a very conservative French Catholic family, um, sent her to a home for unwed mothers under an assumed name. And, and that's a member of our family who we haven't met to this day. Uh, and we, we tried to find. So, you know, I think we need, we need to move a lot of things forward. I think the ERA needs to pass. I think it's been way too long. Um, I think that pay equity needs to be something we focus on with a laser beam. Uh, and I think that in a world where Viagra is covered by insurance, why the heck is it birth control? Thank you. Again, I think we're all in agreement. Um, I uh, am married to a woman who was who was uh, raised by by raised she and her sister uh, who was widowed during the Vietnam War. Raised these kids. Uh, one off one went off to Pomona College. One went to Stanford. One's a surgeon. Uh, the other one's a museum professional. Uh, we have three daughters in our home. Um, I. I would never say that I'm a feminist. I would let them tell you if I was a feminist. <laughs> now we've raised our kids, we've raised our daughters to, to realize that they have every opportunity that any male, boy, whatever out there has and to do what is right for them and to not do something that would make them appealing or make them, make them you know, make somebody else like them or, or, or accept them. Um, it's amazing, um, I have one brother, and I have a very large extended family, but um, when, when, we were, when my wife was pregnant with our third daughter, somebody said, oh, don't you want a boy, don't you want a boy? And I said, honestly, I wouldn't know what to do with them. <laughs> Plus, we have all the clothes. <laughs> so, um, you know, raising, living in a house with three, four women is fabulous. It's been a great life, uh, it's so far, and, um, you know, and coming from a very matriarchal family that my wife comes from, it's unbelievable. And I also live in a community, of, it, like some of these communities, people think, and it's kind of like, men think they run things. <laughs> they don't. You know, in our community, they don't. And I think that the key is, is that we have to make sure that everybody is paid equally for what they do. Um, whether you're a movie star and you get 1.5 million and your Coast Guard gets $1,000 to reshoot some scenes, or whether you're working at the island market, or whether you're working at Dairy Queen, everybody needs equal pay for equal work. Thank you. Um, you know, I think I will uh, follow Craig's lead a little bit in saying that I, I don't know that I would uh, go ahead and call myself a feminist because I, I, something that is very important to me uh, that I've learned in leadership, both in my military experiences, but also in the main state legislatures, knowing when to lead and when to let others lead. And when it comes to everything going on in this country today with the women's movement, things like the Women's March yesterday, I know that it's not my time to lead, it's my time to support. Um, someone just asked me today whether or not I spoke yesterday at the Women's March in Augusta, and I was very happy to report no, I did not, because there were so many strong, incredible women leaders that, that did so, uh, and, and, and they, they, they did an amazing job. Um, I'm 100% behind gender equality. Every vote I've ever taken in the legislature relevant to that, and across the board, all issues represents that, uh, I think, quite clearly. Um, 
the Speaker of the House, Sarah Gideon, is an amazingly strong leader in this state. The Majority Leader, Aaron Herbert, he's an amazingly strong leader in this state. And I feel very comfortable in my role as the Assistant Majority Leader behind those two, letting them do the good hard work that they're capable of doing, and they're doing an astoundingly good job. Uh, my role is, is to support the caucus and, and make sure everyone can be successful and to support them as, as leaders. So. Um, certainly, I have, I have no problem with, with accepting the, the strength of women leaders in, in this state. In regards to reproductive rights, I'm 100% pro-choice. Uh, family planning, services, access to all of that. There's no budge. I'm not going to give an inch on it. Uh, it. It's very clearly your choice. Um. <clears throat> Yes, I consider myself a feminist because I, I consider feminism the uh, acknowledging and supporting the power of women as leaders and as, as people. So yeah, that makes sense. Of course I support that. I consider myself on board. Um, reproductive rights, I, I support completely uh, women's right to their body at all parts of the reproductive, including birth, and uh, as well as you know, contraception and birth control, um, and abortions. and. Um, I would say that, yeah, I think, one of the agreements I made was that, I think there, it's interesting that there was five men running for the seat and no women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that in, and that is unfortunate. And that I've made a commitment as a person seeking public office, that if I'm ever running for a public position where there is a qualified woman who is progressive, and has a shot, has a solid shot at winning, I will step aside. Wow. <laughs> because I believe that too often women have been conditioned to do that automatically. And that that is something that I don't even notice, that privilege which I carry all the time. So it's 4.30. I'm going to try to wrap it up now. I have two more questions. I would really love to hear from all five of you on these two questions. For the sake of time, I'm going to make these 30 second answers. I think each of them certainly easily could be two minute answers. <laughs> Frankly, they could be much longer than that. But because we're running up a little bit against the clock, I'm going to have to make them 30 second answers, okay? So the first one is, um, following. It's about um, rights for our LGBTQ um, on their status in society and what you would do to protect this vulnerable community. Let's start with Craig Olson in the middle. Thank you. I believe everybody should have the right to live however they want to live, with however they want to identify, and that identification needs to be upheld. Very basic. I have a daughter who's in school um, in her college, and different colleges are dealing with different ways of how they deal with it. And her college says, however that person identifies when they come into their college, if they identify as a woman, we will admit <coughs> Doesn't that, No question, that's it. If that's how you identify, she goes to work in college. Um, so if that's how you identify, that's what it is, and we have to have protection. Let's go to Jonathan Fulford next, please. Yeah, I think that um, that anyone with the LGBTQ community needs to be recognized as having full rights as any other group of people or any other, um, and that any discrimination in any way should be uh, uh, fought, and that full rights should be fought for on a federal level. So. Yeah, Mr. Bolden. Full equal access to full equality, full access to justice, uh, economic justice, healthcare justice, all you know, justice before the law for all people, all citizens in the United States is what I support, and that that certainly includes our LGBTQ community. I'll do I'll do whatever I got to do to make sure everyone has, has equal access. Thank you. Let's go to Mr. Rich. Um, might be quick. I agree with everything everyone said. Um, it's been a long time since Stonewall. Time to stop playing politics with this stuff and actually make it subtle policy. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. LGBTQ rights are <clears throat> human rights. I believe that uh, they, there, there should be equality in the workplace. There should be equality to uh, access to health care. There should be access and, and um, equality when it comes to decisions around 
uh, marriage and the family unit, and I think any discrimination should be punishable. Thank you. All right, so our final question, also the 30 second question, is um, for all of you. Um, and we'll start down on the end with uh, Mr. St. Clair and then just work our way down the table. And the question is, what do you believe should be the highest priorities in developing economic opportunities for the citizens of Maine? I think that's a very difficult answer to a uh, question to answer in 30 seconds. Um, but I, and it has been something that's been, been worked on um, in, in many parts of the state for several decades. I think access to uh, education, affordable education, should be a start. We should be able to find ways to attract young people, embrace an immigration, uh, an immigrant population, and new Mainers that are coming here. We should create communities that uh, allow for people to be able to celebrate uh, whatever type of work they want to do. Uh, and I think infrastructure is going to be a, play a huge role into it, including transportation, rail, and broadband. Yeah, I agree with Lucas on, on everything there. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I mean, the, it, we need to take a real look at what our natural resources are. You know, we have a lot of wood and a lot of wood. And what can we do with stuff like that? Um, I don't know uh, if anybody else has, ever, has, has been over to see Habib yet. I think you have, right? Um, there's an advanced manufacturing center up at the University of Maine, Orono. Um, it's, it's run by this amazing engineer uh, who has been working to build sort of next generation stuff for a long time, whether that be clustered wind farms, or now they're finding a way to, to break down wood and to, uh, and to reformulate it to things like a recyclable car body. You know, really interesting stuff that's going on in Maine. We need to keep it in Maine. Affordable health care, a living wage, infrastructure, and a big portion of that is broadband. 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 Uh, I want to start with something I care uh, about and want to see done at a federal level, which is universal head start, uh, making sure that every child gets a head start and a good education. Fair living wages, we're working on that, we'll get to $12 an hour, that's not good enough universal access to health care. And finally, I think making a commitment to get back to those good New Deal principles that help create the middle class. You should, if you work hard all your life, be able to retire. We need to get back to focusing on pension systems and other retirement uh, programs. And if that means fighting to strengthen unions to make sure that we're bargaining for those types of rights, all of these rights I just named, then that's what I'm committed to. I like what I'm hearing. Um, 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 uh, if I don't win, I'm really glad that this is the, you know, we've got to go. Um, so I think I've already said climate change and dealing with that because it's a problem we have to face and it'll be an economic engine. Um, universal single payer health care as a small business owner, I know that that is devastating for both employees that can't afford it and small business trying to start and run. Um, a fair taxation system where actually the wealthy pay their fair share so it's not on the burdens of everyone else and all the towns and the state. Um, uh, broadband has been mentioned, and I guess I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I would like to give a big round of applause.